All right. So in this session, we are using slido.com where you get an opportunity to ask questions to our speaker today. So if you go in right now, you can join at slido.com and the code is uh, space talks and it will let you uh, submit questions for our speaker throughout the entire presentation today. Um, here are some ground rules. So everyone should listen closely and respectfully to each other. Um, please ask questions when you're curious or confused. Keep questions short and um, especially if they're in the Zoom chat or on the um, slider.com just to make it like easy to read. And most importantly, have fun. Um, here are our remaining speakers for the month of July. So next week we have Dr. Hilding Nielsen and the week after we have Dr. Allison Brady. And here's our speaker for today, uh, Thomas Sears. So Thomas is currently a PhD candidate at Queen's University. He's researching how to make uh, mobile robots like lunar or Mars rovers detect and uh, model changes in the environment. He has previously worked as an engineer for five years at the Sinclair Interplanetary, now a part of uh, Rocket Lab in, on, in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, tonight, he will talk to us about how uh, about space debris and how to clean it up. So feel free to ask any questions to the chat window or on the Slido. Um, so the link, uh, the uh, code is hash, uh, space talks, and it's also at the bottom of this page. Um, and yeah, Thomas, it's uh, your turn. Okay, perfect. Thank you, and uh, thank you for coming, everyone. This is a full Zoom window. Um, can't imagine what kind of room we'd be in if we were all together, but I feel like it would be pretty cozy. So I'm really happy to see everyone. I'm just going to click a few buttons here to make sure I can see you. You can see some some pictures that I'm going to be showing. Great, I got some thumbs up. And um, and I think like Prachi said, thank you Prachi for that introduction. Uh, if you have questions as we go, please just leave them in the chat um, and we'll get we'll get to them at the end. Uh, but I'll also, I might ask a few things as we're going and feel free to throw some feedback into the chat window as well. So my, I'm going to talk, I think, a little bit about me so that you can learn a little bit about myself as a, as a space professional. But we'll also try to cover, I think, a, a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart, which is uh, orbital debris and, and really making sure that space around Earth uh, stays accessible for everybody in the future so that we don't make too much of a mess up there so that we can't use it. So that's why I went with Space Jam. I thought it was a fun topical, topical one. We got a bit of a traffic jam with debris up there. So this photo that, that I'm showing you, I hope everyone can see, is um, it's a photo taken by OSIRIS-REx of the Earth on the left and the Moon on the right. Uh, there's, there's only a few photos we have like this where we take these really amazing pictures showing uh, the Earth just floating through the, the solar system uh, and you can see, all you see is the planet. You don't see anything else. You don't see our satellites or our spaceships or our countries or our flags. You just see us as a planet. And um, I really think that that thinking is important to, to how we uh, access space. Now, I, I appreciated Prachi had a, had a nice um, land acknowledgement there. And, and I also want to just acknowledge that uh, I'm coming to you, I'm beaming in from Kingston. Uh, and Kingston is on the lands of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee. And this photo I have is actually one I took uh, here in Kingston at night. Um, I'm originally from Toronto, but coming out here, I get these beautiful clear night skies. And as of today, you can still look out and see stars and it is absolutely beautiful. Uh, there's, there's really nothing ruining this, this view. And for, for many people, this is a sacred view. I think it's important that we really acknowledge the past and the present because we are talking about space exploration. And in the name of exploration, many terrible things have been done. Uh, going forward, we need to make sure that all perspectives are respected, not just engineers like myself, not just scientists and CEOs. We really need to make sure that everyone's voice is heard um, as we look out into the cosmos. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I think we can do to make that better, but. I, I, I just want to make sure that we all respect that keeping the night sky for all future generations, this pristine, beautiful, sacred place uh, is really important. So 
even if we're sending Mars rovers, we got to make sure that we're doing it in the right way. Okay, so meet a space professional. So that's me. I'm Thomas. It's it's wonderful to meet you. Um, a colleague took this gif of me dancing one day, so I figured why not share it because I'm not always a serious guy. I like to I like to have fun. So Pratchy said that I'm a PhD candidate. I'm also an engineer, uh, and and that's something I've sort of flip flopped between now. I've gone back to school. Things I care about, well, the Earth. I care about space. I care about planets, but I also care about all people, and I care about all animals. So those are the five things I care about. I'm not just a a, a math person that sits at a computer all day. I care about a lot of real things. Um, what got me into engineering? Well, I really like science, really like technology, but I also really like the environment. And I think space is a really neat way to put all of those things together to try to help take care of, of the earth. Um, I did want to point out that engineers aren't just boring people. Uh, that's, that's sometimes a, a stereotype that comes up. I like to cycle and swim. I, over the pandemic, got into yoga. That's been pretty fun. Uh, but I also really like building things. And I know it's hard to see, but if somewhere in my background here is my stash of Lego, uh, I've got the Lego space shuttle, I've got the Lego spaceship from the Lego movie. Um, basically, I try to buy every Lego spaceship that exists. So, um, oh, and an X-Wing. Yep, there's an X-Wing back there. So, you know, building things, that's, you know, really the heart of engineering. I won't comment much on that last point, dancing, okay-ish. So, I did say I wanted to just say a little bit about what it is that I do as a space professional. And then I think we'll talk about space debris. So this is me today, uh, maybe not today, today, but uh, a little while ago. Uh, nowadays, I'm a roboticist. So I work with robots um, here on Earth. I don't work with ones in space yet, but we work with those to make and test new algorithms so that we can do better exploration um, when we're on another planet or here on Earth. So this is me and my PhD supervisor. We're taking a look at a couple of the robots we have in our lab here at Queen's University. Uh, and, and here we use AI and machine learning. So we put all that together, we put it together with robots and that allows us to take artificial intelligence and interact with the world around us. Before I was doing this, I built satellites. So I used to build satellites, actual satellites. Um, this is a picture of me working in what's called a clean room. So this is like a super clean air facility to make sure that there's zero particles in the air going and uh, disrupting the electronics or the optics so that everything works perfectly when it goes to space. So that device, uh, if you can see me kind of holding something, that device right there is definitely, it's, it's in space now. Um, but at that time I was just putting it together. So one of the jobs I've had to do is design and build all of these gizmos that have gone into space to help satellites and spacecraft do their jobs. So we can talk a little bit about that later, but I'm gonna go even further back into my history. So far back, I have a ponytail, okay? So <laughs> we're going back to when I was actually a graduate student at the University of Toronto. And in, in this case, I was working on a space debris mitigation mission. What does that mean? It means I was building a satellite designed to reduce space debris. And this was such a cool project. I was so excited to get to work on it. Um, this was actually as a graduate student. So maybe when some of you get a little bit older, if you wanna do graduate school, you can go and build satellites at this facility in Toronto. Really great opportunity. And we're gonna talk a lot about some of this work that I got to do, but I think we're gonna need some context first. So this, this is the question, I think to really understand what's around earth in space. I bet we have some guesses. I've put a big answer here, which is satellites. There's a lot of satellites in, around Earth. And if you have any thoughts, feel free to put them into the chat if that's something you want to do. Feel free to add that there. But we've got lots of satellites around Earth. But we also have lots of other things. We've got old rockets. We've got broken pieces. A couple of astronauts have dropped bags and tools. Um, sometimes just satellites stop working. So it's actually just old satellites. There's a lot of stuff that's not just working uh, useful satellites in space. And that's a bit of a problem. So when we look at, at space, um, we have orbits. And orbits are basically the loops you get caught in when you're outside of a planet or a moon. 
just like our Earth orbits the sun and just like the moon orbits the Earth, we can send these robots, these satellites or spacecraft into Earth orbit and they'll just go around Earth all the time, never stopping. But depending on how high you go, changes what you can do. So in low Earth orbit is, is the first realm of orbit. Um, we have things like the International Space Station and the Hubble Space Telescope. And I bet some of you have heard of these two because they're some of the most famous spacecraft that have ever happened. All right, I see a thumbs up. Now they're really close actually. So if, uh, if you're in Toronto, Montreal is further away than the International Space Station is. When that space station comes flying overhead, you're closer to the space station than Montreal is. So um, that's just, I just know Toronto geography really well. So I, I, it's similar in other places. If you're across the country, if you're on the west coast of Canada and you drove to the east coast of Canada, you've gone way farther than the space station might be. So low earth orbit is actually really close. And it's where we put a lot of satellites. And if you know any satellites that might be in low earth orbit, I'd also like to see what you put in the chat. But that's where we tend to put satellites that take pictures of the Earth, communicate with the Earth. And more recently, you might have heard of some of these constellations designed to give us internet. So we put those all in low Earth orbit. There's a lot of satellites there. And, and we'll talk about that. But there's, there's other places satellites can go. In medium Earth orbit, this is sort of this big green section. That's where a really important satellite ends up. And I wonder if anyone knows what one of the most important satellites might be. Hmm. I'll give everyone a second to think because I know we can't really chat about it in, in live. But when I pick up my phone and I pull up Google Maps and I ask Google Maps, where am I? It's a satellite that talks to my phone and helps me figure it out. And that's the GPS constellation. There's actually a few constellations now. There's the Global Positioning System, there's GLONASS, there's uh, there's, uh, there's a, there, anyway, ever, lots of countries are now building their own global navigation systems, but it's based on satellites in this medium Earth orbit, sending out radio signals to all of our devices, our cars, our phones, our laptops, um, everything that could possibly move nowadays has a GPS receiver in it. And that's really important there too. So we've got, so we've got really important things in low Earth orbit. We've got really important things in medium Earth orbit. And I bet you can guess, we've got really important things in high Earth orbit too. That's where our TV, our communications uh, satellites go and live. They go live way up in what's called geosynchronous orbit. They're so far away, 36,000 kilometers. You've never driven that far, I can, I can promise you. Um, they're way up there and they're so far away that when they move, they actually don't even look like they move in the night sky. So it's a really cool spot where you can be, where you stay still and you look like a star. But that's really important for communications. And again, you don't want things to get too cluttered up there because again, these are really important spots. You can't make a second spot for this. You need to preserve uh, the space that's in that one. And I will say that the further you go out, the bigger these satellites get. When you get out to high earth orbit, these satellites are the size of school buses. They are massive. Um, closer to earth, you can have some that fit in the size of your hands. But when you go far out, they're really, really big. So with all of these satellites, all of these satellites, I'm talking thousands of satellites, I bet we can probably see some of them, right? So there's, here's a photo taken in 1972. This is long before I was born. But this was in the Apollo era, and they took a photo of the Earth. And back then, there weren't that many satellites. So I mean, it kind of makes sense. We just see the Earth, right? Nothing to see. Beautiful planet Earth. Well, let's step forward to yesterday. Let's see what, what the Earth looked like yesterday. Do you, do you think we're going to see all the satellites now? Maybe just nods or, yeah, you think some so thumbs down if you don't think we're going to see any satellites. Some, some thumbs up, thumbs, thumbs down. Okay, so there's thousands of satellites now. Let's see what Earth looks like. Huh. I don't see any of them. I just see this. I just see Earth again. So I just told you there's thousands of these satellites, and I don't see a single one. Kind of strange, right? So where are they? And I, and and this is kind of an interesting problem because you can't see what's going on. We can't see with our own eyes, just with our own cameras. We need to do something different. So where is everything? And this is where we need to enhance 
our senses. We can't just use our eyes. We can't just use cameras. We have to use what's called radar, which is using radio waves to see things. And if we do that, it's a very, very, very different picture. When we look at the earth in radar, we see something totally different. We see things everywhere. There are satellites in all of these different orbits. There's debris floating around the earth. And we need to make sure that we manage this. So this, this, is, this image you're seeing is a mixture of real actual observations of satellites and a mixture of what's a probability of where things might be. So a best guess. We can't actually observe all of these objects. So this is just a, a statistical guess as to where things could be. The red dots are actual satellites, real functioning satellites, but you can see that there's just so many, it's hard to even wrap your mind around it. Now, if you pay real close attention, what you will notice is that there's some rings, there's some shapes to all of this. There's a big ring around the outside, that's the high earth orbit. There's sort of a shell in the middle, that's the medium earth orbit, and then right around the earth, that's low earth orbit where it's super cluttered. So you can see there's so much going on. How much of this is satellites? How much of this is debris? These are things we really need to think about, but we should probably make sure we're not making too much mess in this space around Earth. So what is up there? And, and it's really neat because the scientists can track all of this. It's so cool. What's up there are big objects. And when I say big objects, I mean satellites. They might be the size of something that fits in your hand, like a loaf of bread, or they might be the size of a bus, but we can actually track all of those objects as long as they're about the size of a softball or bigger. So if you've got something that can fit in the palm of your hand, we can probably track that in space. Now, if things get a little bit smaller, oh, sorry, and I should say, we've got about 20,000 things in space that are that size or bigger. So that size or bigger. Medium objects are things that are a little bit smaller, maybe down to one centimeter in size. So one centimeter, that's like the size of your eyeball, right? They're, they're pretty hard to track. And we estimate that there's about a million objects in space bigger than one centimeter, a million. Could you imagine trying to organize, like in my mind, I'm thinking a Lego collection with a million pieces would be incredibly difficult. But that's not it. We can go even smaller. What if we considered objects that are smaller than a centimeter? Now, when we get down to that, we're talking about things like paint flecks, little pieces of debris that might've come off of a satellite. We estimate that there's over 100 million objects like that in orbit. I couldn't find a good picture of a paint fleck, so I went with paint plus Ben Affleck, which I figured was close enough. But those, you know, there's no cans of space or, or cans of paint or Ben Affleck in space, but combined close enough. But there's hundreds of millions. So what do we do? Uh, so th this is the thing. We, we've generated all this debris. It's there. So the question that I'm pondering is how can we do better in the future and how can we clean it up? But there's lots up there to look at. So why does this matter? Um, why does space debris matter that much? Because it's it's up there, but you haven't you haven't heard in the news, you know, any big problems, right? Um, space debris has sort of been going on for years now, uh, but I think I can really illustrate it with this. And I was I was thinking about some of this, and there's some really fun math you can do. And maybe for some of our older attendees, this math will be really familiar. But I'll try to make sure everyone understands where I'm going. If we took a school bus a big school bus, um, we can calculate how much energy a school bus has when it's driving down the highway. And we can, what we need to calculate that is the mass of the school bus, which is 11,000 kilograms, and the speed it moves, which is about 100 kilometers an hour if it's on the highway. Let's compare that, just, just having fun. If I was on the space station and I had my phone and I accidentally dropped it, and it floated out into space. Like, whoops, there goes my phone. So if I had an iPhone in space, well, an iPhone only weighs 170 grams, which is way less than a bus, right? I bet lots of people here can lift an iPhone. I bet less people can lift a bus. 
But in space, things are moving so fast. In space, objects move at rates which don't even make sense. In this case, when you're orbiting the Earth, you could be moving seven kilometers per second. So going back to my analogy about Toronto to, to Montreal, you could do that in like 100 seconds. It takes six hours to drive from Toronto to Montreal. Could you imagine doing it in a minute and a half? That's how fast things are moving in space. And here's, here's the real interesting thing. If we talk about energy of an object, we can talk about what's called kinetic energy which is how, basically a, uh, a combination of the speed and the weight of the object. And the way we calculate that is with this, is with this equation. One half multiplied by the, the mass multiplied by the speed all squared. And for, for some of our older attendees, you might recognize one half mv squared to be the equation for kinetic energy. If we take the numbers that I've just shown you and we plug it in, so how much energy does a school bus have? Well, a school bus has about 4.3 megajoules. Now, a megajoule, it's hard to kind of grasp what that number is like, but you can imagine a, a school bus driving past you at, at 100 kilometers an hour, just going super fast. And you could just imagine the kind of damage a school bus could cause if it were to hit a tree or a wall or something like that. But here's the interesting thing. An iPhone in space also has about 4.3 megajoules of energy. So that iPhone, even though it's this big and it fits in the palm of your hand, it's moving so fast, it has the same amount of energy as a school bus driving 100 kilometers an hour. So if you threw me your iPhone in space, I don't think I would try to catch it. You could imagine that the damage that something as small as an iPhone could cause if it hit something else in space would be catastrophic. We have to be very careful because we don't want our satellites to be destroyed. We don't want our space stations to be destroyed. We don't want our rockets to be destroyed. And these small objects can cause a lot of real significant damage. And this is not something that's um, in theory. This is not something that people have just thought about. This has really happened. Thankfully, so far, it's been very small. Just last month, there was a news article about the Canadarm, this remote robot arm in space built in Canada, having some new damage on the actual arm itself. And on the left there, you can actually see the hole that some space debris caused, just punctured right through the side. Luckily, the Canada arm still works. But what, what are the chances? We just don't know. And then on the right, caused by an even smaller object, just a fleck of paint. This is an astronaut pointing at the damage on the outside of a window that just had a fleck of paint hit it. But you know, a fleck of paint on Earth will just blow away in the wind. But a fleck of paint in orbit hits with so much, so much energy, it's able to actually crack a little bit of the glass. So you can imagine getting space debris really ramped down is really important to make sure that it's safe up there for people. But not all of us are going to go to space. So what's the importance of space debris to us on Earth? Well, you know what? It turns out that satellites are incredibly important to us on Earth. There's so many things here. For, for a lot of us, things like the weather forecasting, that's all done with satellites. So if we had satellites get damaged that were doing weather forecasting, and we couldn't look forward to see what's going to happen tomorrow, we wouldn't know if it's going to rain or sun. We wouldn't know what to do. Uh, we wouldn't have our GPS, maybe, if a GPS satellite got damaged by space debris. And again, imagine how lost we'd all be. I don't really know how to use a map anymore while I'm driving. So like I rely on my phone to tell me where to go. <laughs> but there'd be other things that, are, that seem a little less, um, a little less likely, but things like internet would cut out for people who are in remote areas, um, especially on, on water and in Northern Canada where we don't have landlines connecting things. One that's really interesting, ATMs, our ability to go and get money and pay for services, that would potentially go down if we lost the GPS constellation. So there's lots of, there's lots of things that would go wrong if we saw some major problems happening to satellites because of space debris. But it's not like we need to stress out too quickly. And I want to make an analogy to explain it. Space is actually pretty big and pretty empty. 
And I think this illustrates it pretty well. This is a photo um, of all the airplanes over North America at a given time, just like a snapshot, all the airplanes over North America. All those little airplanes you can see are all a real plane carrying people somewhere. It looks really cluttered, right? It looks super busy. How are the airplanes dodging each other? Well, the, the, the thing is, is that we as humans tend to think sort of on the ground. We tend to think cars and traffic, but airplanes can go up and down. So as airplanes are able to fly above each other and below each other, they don't even come close to each other. And satellites are the same way. They go above each other, they go below each other. Um, there's lots of space. But space debris isn't controlled, unlike an airplane. An airplane, we know where it is. We know where it's going and a pilot can turn and move and get out of the way and, and that's great. There's lots of cooperation. But space debris is, is like, uh, it's junk. It's stuff that's just floating around. We don't have control over it and we might not even know where it is. So it's a little bit, uh, it's good. There's lots of space, but it's a little bit bad because we don't know where all of it is. And while we have, like I said, 20,000 or so objects bigger than a softball in space right now, there are some companies aiming to put way more in space. It's taken us 60 years to put 20,000 objects into space. There are companies that wanna put 50,000 objects into space over the next few years, more than tripling the number of satellites that we would have, right? So there's a lot more going up. So we really need to make sure we're taking care of it before all of this happens, because we wanna make sure that all of this stuff is safe. We don't wanna cause any damage while things are up there. So I think a lot of people, if you're really into space, you might have heard of Starlink. That's a really popular one built by SpaceX. They want to launch potentially 40,000 satellites. But there's other companies that also want to launch thousands and thousands of satellites. And these are incredible numbers for us working in the space industry. So what can we do? And, and I've got three things. And thankfully, the first one's already a little bit solved. But maybe for some of our young engineers in the audience, there'll be some, some challenges you can tackle when you get a little bit older. So the first one um, is, is to use cleaner rockets. So I'm not sharing my audio, but I think that's okay. What I, what I wanna illustrate, what I wanna illustrate is that rockets once upon a time weren't very clean. They ejected all sorts of material. And you know when they took off from earth, it was very cool, it was loud sounds and, and people were watching and it's all kind of neat. And, um, but when they got into space, they had to do what's called staging, which is where they separate pieces and they drop other pieces. And when they do that, some of these little pieces get left behind. These big pieces fall back to Earth. But if you watch the video, I'm not sure if, it's, if you're able to capture all the little, the little bits, but there's little bits flying around. All of those little bits might end up in orbit with the rocket. And now we've got these little pieces of material, little pieces of metal, nuts and bolts and rings and all of that ends up in space too. So we need to use cleaner rockets, but thankfully there's been some really smart people who have been working on this kind of stuff. And, and I think for, for this sort of current generation of space goers, this is not even surprising. This is, to me, this is still mind boggling, but we now have companies like SpaceX that want to launch rockets into space, bring them back, and look at that. They didn't have to lose anything in space. Um, I think this video is only like a minute, and I would be, I feel really bad if we didn't get to watch the cool part, which is right at the end. So we're just going to like let this run. But cleaner rockets is something that people have been doing, and it's great because that means we have less of these big, bulky pieces of, of nothing left over in space. And instead, we are able to land them back down mind blown onto, onto boats in the middle of oceans. Um, and so this is, this is great, not just for us to watch and be like, wow, that was cool, but it's also really great for our space environment. Less stuff left up there, thumbs up from Thomas. The next thing we can do is actually go and clean up the mess. If any of us dropped something on the ground outside, what would we do? We'd go outside and go get it. But going to get something in space is a little bit tricky especially if it's something really big. If you had a car breakdown on the side of the road, you'd probably call a tow truck, right? 
So what we need is a tow truck for satellites. We need something that goes up into space and collects them and brings them back for us. But that's, that is surprisingly difficult. Things are moving really fast in space and they don't cooperate like a car that's stopped on the side of the street. So some companies have had to really get inventive and think about neat ways to catch satellites. So if you ever have a cool idea of a way to catch a satellite, then maybe this is an avenue that you can explore. This is a, a really interesting one. What you're seeing is a target and a satellite that's gonna shoot a harpoon at it, just like So this satellite actually went into space and practiced shooting a harpoon at a fake satellite as if to go and capture it. And then it would tug it back down to earth and they would both deorbit and sort of melt in the earth's atmosphere. So that's one thing they could do. Another company, this one here, they figured out that they could shoot a net. So they shot a big net in space. So they shot a huge net and they went and it captured a satellite and they can reel it in. And as the, after they reel it in, then they can drag it back down to earth again. And when you drag something back down to earth, what actually happens is you're moving so fast that you actually uh, burn up in the earth's atmosphere, just like a meteor. So, you know, when you see a cool shooting star, it could be a, a meteorite. It actually could be a piece of space technology, depending on, on what you're seeing. But that's the intention. You do that, it burns up completely. There's no debris left over. And, uh, and then space is clean again. So that's another way. We could go there and clean it up. We can try to actually go and clean it up. But I would say, if you've got to clean up the mess, maybe we shouldn't have made the mess in the first place. Maybe we should have just kept it clean to start with. Why are our satellites stuck up there orbiting around for hundreds of years, leaving a mess? You wouldn't throw something on the ground. You just take it to the garbage can, right? Or the recycling. <laughs> so something I got to work on based on my, my earlier uh, comment about my graduate studies was this really cool satellite about the size of a loaf of bread. It would fit in the palms of our hands if we just held it there, right? It's the length of a ruler and just fits in your hands. And I got to build this system to deploy a, like a parachute for space. It's called a drag sail. And it would, while the satellite's really small, it's able to orbit no problem. But what would happen is when you're done with it, you would deploy this sail. And when you do that, you actually, just like you would a boat or a parachute, you catch a little bit of wind. And you might be thinking, well, there's, you're in space. There's no wind in space. There's a teeny tiny little bit of wind in space, teeny tiny little bit. And if you've got a big enough catch, a big enough sail, you can actually slow yourself down a little bit on it. And by doing that, our satellite will eventually burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. So when we're done with the satellite, it burns up and we don't have to worry about it anymore. No one has to think about our satellite being space debris. So um, this is an old video. Again, I don't have that long hair anymore, but this was the technology that I was helping develop, this, this system that would deploy a sail when the time comes. And I think I've got a photo. Oh, I did want to show this. I just like showing rocket launches, so why not? This was really cool. Our, our satellite got to go up in 2016 from India on a PSLV rocket. Um, it was a, uh, on a, with a group of satellites, but uh, India's got this fantastic rocket program, um, super reliable rocket. Uh, it's, it's really fun to kind of see our stuff going up. And I got to, I didn't get to go there and watch it live, but I got to watch it live on kind of like on the internet. Um, and knowing that our satellite got to go up uh, and it was successful and it was safe and healthy was super exciting. But um, yeah, so my little satellite was riding on top of that big ball of fire. And uh, thankfully, the, the team in India did a great job and they got their rocket and everybody else got there nice and safe. So we were able to, after a few months of our mission, finally deploy all of our sails. Now, we don't have a photo of what that looks like, but what it does look like on the ground is this picture on the left. You've In the middle, I think maybe my mouse is visible, you can see this little middle piece here. That's about the size of a loaf of bread. But when you deploy those sails, it becomes meters across. My arms couldn't even reach it. I wouldn't even be able to touch the edges. And it's so big that it'll actually deorbit. And in a few years, it hasn't deorbited yet. It's still in space. But in a few years, it's going to come streaking through the atmosphere just like a meteor. And when that happens, we don't have to worry about it anymore. And that's really important because sometimes satellites can take hundreds of years to deorbit by themselves. And we're able to do it much faster in just a couple. 
So it's, that's, that's a really important thing. We don't have to worry about it anymore. So my hope is that we can all be good space stewards. Um, and I really want to avoid having too much of a mess. I like this space jam pun I'm going with. I don't want to make a space jam in our solar system. That's for the movies. That's for the cartoon. It's not for us, not for, it's not for orbit. And we are exploring so many different places. I've talked about Earth, but we've got robots on Mars and the moon, and we're thinking about going back to Venus and going to moons like Europa. And we're thinking about going to all of these places, but we need to make sure that we're being smart about not taking garbage with us and leaving trash behind. We need to make sure we do it in a really responsible way because we don't own any of these places. We don't own the moon. We don't own Mars. It's everybody's. Um, and that's that's where I'm going to leave it. And I'll be happy to take questions. Of course, uh, I'll put down that if anybody wants to find me afterwards, I know that my Twitter account is somewhere in one of the, the promotional posts, one of the marketing posts, but you can always find me. I'm Astro Sears on Twitter. Feel free. You can ask me questions um, about space things um, or just follow along. And sometimes I tweet about the really cool space things that are happening. So that's that's it for me. Um, I will be super happy to hear what questions we have. And I'll invite any questions about engineering, um, space technology, satellites, um, or you know what I do, things like that. Whatever you want. I'm, I'm, all, I'm all here. OK, that was amazing. Uh, so virtual round of applause. Um, it was. I was learning new things as well, as much as I'm, I'm a bit familiar with some of these topics. Um, but again, a reminder in the Zoom chat, I've placed the Slido um, link and the uh, code. Um, there are a few questions already in there. So Thomas, I'm going to go through uh, one at a time. And, and in the meantime, if others have questions, use Slido or just use our Zoom chat, right? Um, so first question. Uh, you may have touched on this again, but uh, if there are so many satellites out there, how do the rockets and the ISS move around in space? Because one can touch, one touch can change the destination of a rocket. Yeah, that is so true. I, I want to comment on that last part first. Uh, one touch can change the destination of a rocket. In, in, in space, if you poke something, there's nothing to stop it from moving. It'll just sort of tumble. It'll it'll move around. It'll, it'll spin and fall. And you might see that if you ever watch a video of an astronaut on the space station, if they're just floating there and someone pokes them, they'll just start flying away. So so definitely a little touch can make a big difference. The 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 important point that I I tried to, to kind of explain earlier was that there are lots of things in space, and we do need to make sure we know where they all are. But um, there's also lots of room. And we do track everything. So every time a new rocket goes, uh, goes up to space, we do do a little forecast. We do like a space debris forecast. What's up there? Are we going to be flying near anything? Um, and that's, that's really important. Even for rocket launches with people on board, it's especially important. We want to make sure we know where, uh, where things are before we go. And if you own a satellite, I don't know if anyone here owns a satellite. I don't. But if anyone owns a satellite, you can also get emails that actually tell you when your satellite is getting really close to another satellite. And if they're getting too close, you get an alert. You get like a notification on your phone and it says, hey, satellite operator Thomas, your satellite is getting a little bit too close to another satellite. You might want to consider if you've got a, an ability to move, you might want to consider moving a little bit to get out of the way. Um, so that's how things move around in space safely. One, there's actually a lot of room, but when things get close, we have systems that try to keep keep track of um, who's where. But sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes the really small pieces still hit you. And uh, right now, we just have to live with that. OK, uh, thanks, Prachi, for putting up the screen. So Thomas, I think you can see the next oh, yeah. question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who's, who's Ben Affleck? Well, he's just. He's a Hollywood person. It, it's, it, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. He's an actor. But do satellites pollute space? Um, in a way, they do. I think a functional satellite offers a lot of value, and I wouldn't consider it pollution. I would consider a satellite that's working to do its job is really important. We've got satellites that monitor Earth's climate. We've got satellites that are staring at, at ice and sea levels and forest fires 
and they're helping people on the ground every day, protecting them, um, making sure their lives are, uh, making sure they're safe and, and all sorts of great, great things like that. But sometimes satellites break. And unfortunately, when a satellite breaks, we don't have a way to go and get it. If, if we can't do that, it is pollution, you're right. So satellites start out good, but if they, if they break down for some reason, um, or if they're poorly made and they kind of fall apart, um, then yeah, they can become space pollution. So that's a, that's a good question. Okay, why does SpaceX and other companies wanna put so many satellites in space? How much money does it cost? Okay, so um, unlike your, your internet that goes to your house, if, if, if uh, for the people who live in urban areas, you probably have one internet cable that runs to your neighborhood or to your building and it shares your entire um, neighborhood, your, 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 maybe the people on your floor, the people in your, in your street, you all share like one cable of internet. And that's great. We just put in one cable and everybody can kind of like go and run another cable to connect to it. Now, if you want to do internet in space, you need to make sure you've got satellites over everybody all the time. And satellites can't stay still, they have to move. So in order for that to work, you need to make sure you've got one satellite over every little piece of land on the planet. And SpaceX wants to make sure they can cover the entire planet in internet. And the way they figured to do that is they would need about 10 to 40,000 satellites. And a lot of those are spares in case something goes wrong, they can swap a working satellite in and pull a bad satellite out but um, they have to put all of those up just to give us internet coverage. Whether or not that's the best way for us to get internet, I don't know, but that's why they need so many. How much does it cost to put a satellite in space? Uh, big, these are big numbers. Um, in the space industry, we tend to talk in the millions of dollars in order to do any of these sorts of missions. Um, big, big, big satellites can cost billions of dollars. So that's a lot of money. Small, small, small satellites, can, even the cheapest satellites, even they might cost $100,000. So there's, there's big numbers uh, in, in, the set, in the space industry. And that's because everything is typically made out of really fancy materials and fancy components. And it's because we try to make satellites survive while they're operating in space. It's a, it's a, tough, it's a tough gig, but it takes some of the best things we can make. So that's why it costs so much money. All right, um, how much debris is there approximately? So debris is, is assessed by size. And we know that for debris that's bigger than a softball, bigger than like a watermelon, there's thousands of pieces. Um, but that's not just debris, it's also working satellites. Then when we go to smaller particles, uh, like little bits, um, you can imagine just like any little, chip crumbs, any sort of like a, a grain of rice, those kind of size objects, there's millions of them, just millions of them. We can't actually track them all. We just know they're there because our radars can detect their presence, but we don't know where they are exactly. So there's potentially millions of small pieces of debris in orbit. Okay, I saw one that was about a chain reaction. Oh, all right, we'll do this astronaut one first. Oh, it's moving on me. All right. uh, I think questions are coming in a bit more frequently oh, because okay. things are moving, yeah. but um, okay, cool. and they're also getting voted. So like, so they're, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So the more what's votes the... the question gets, it moves up. And so Prachi, you may have to go back and forth. Wonder, wonderful. That's okay. No. So what's the biggest satellite to burn up in the atmosphere? Actually, I don't know the answer to that question, but I can tell you that sometimes things are too big and they don't burn up. So uh, it, it depends a lot on how the satellite is built. So it gets a little bit complicated trying to assess whether or not something will burn up in the atmosphere or survive. But we have had full-size space stations not get destroyed in the atmosphere and they have come landing back on earth. We've also had pieces of rockets actually quite recently land back on earth and they survive coming back. So you can't always rely on burning up in the atmosphere unless you know for sure that you're small enough and you're not sort of built super tough. If you're not built super tough, you'll burn up. But some things like rockets and space stations, they're built really tough. So when they hit the atmosphere, pieces still get through. So if you actually look in the, in the history, there was the Mir space station. I believe it landed in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, 
I believe Australia issued them a ticket for um, debris. Uh, for debris, yeah, for for essentially polluting on their yeah. on their land. Um, so Russia, I don't know if Russia ever paid that that <laughs> fine, but but that was a huge thing, huge thing, because people lived on there. Okay, can astronauts try to change satellites in the way that? Yep. Yeah. So actually, it's not it's not even astronauts; it's people on the ground. It's operators that are on the ground are able to. Uh, use thrusters on satellites to move them out of the way. So if you know in a day you might get close to another satellite, you can just do a little nudge now and you won't even be close to it later. Um, so that's that's one thing we do. And then for the International Space Station, the International Space Station has big rockets on it. It is also able to move, uh, which is a bit more of a, a bit more work, but they are able to move the space station out of the way as well. That only happens if things are really critical. Um, but it is something that is a technical capability of the space station. They can maneuver it uh, in an emergency. Okay, if a satellite is falling through Earth's atmosphere at such speed that it melts, won't it hurt the atmosphere too? So that's a really good question. So when things are coming into the atmosphere, you're right. They're they're burning up so they're going so fast. They're so hot that the the materials, the metal and the plastic, it essentially becomes gas. It turns into to a gas. Um, so in a way, you're right. We've actually taken aluminum and plastic and copper and some other and gold and all these other materials, which we've mined out of the earth, and we've turned them into, into particles that are now in the air. So in a little way, we've actually polluted air when we do that. Now, I, I would uh, completely agree. Polluting the air is not a good thing to do. It is never the right thing to do. Um, the, the, the amount of material though that's in a satellite is quite small. We are talking just about kilograms of material, whereas you know um, a car might pollute many, many kilograms just on a drive. So yes, you are 100% you are right. We, we don't wanna always rely on the atmosphere, especially for really big things, especially if they're carrying toxic uh, materials. Um, or dangerous materials. In that case, we might want to actually try to bring it back to Earth safely and dispose of it properly. Uh, and that's something we actually used to be able to do with the old space uh, space shuttle. The space shuttle used to be able to go and grab things, put it in its bay, and bring it back to Earth. But we don't have that system anymore. OK, I know you can bring things uh, back from space. Yeah, OK, so that's what I just said, actually, the a bit of the space shuttle. Uh, build a rocket with lots of fuel, put a net on the side. That's exactly it. That's That's perfect. If you can take a rocket and go up into space with a big net or a garbage bag and collect a whole bunch of stuff and then come back and, and kind of put it in the Earth's atmosphere and let it burn up, that's a perfect way to get rid of some of the space debris, especially the small stuff. You can go and collect that. And some people even use, uh, some people even consider using magnets because a lot of space debris is metallic. So you can go up with a magnet and collect it all and then just toss that towards the atmosphere and it'll burn up. All right, another one. How many days does it take to build a satellite? So that is a phenomenal question. Um, there is no standard. Some places take years to build satellites. Um, there's, a, there's a satellite called the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, I believe it has been around for over 10 years, and they are still building it. Um, but they're getting close. It's a, they, they have I, a launch I, date. Yeah, they have a launch date. Um, it is an extremely complicated satellite, extremely complicated. So I'm not making fun of the James Webb Space Telescope. It's an incredible engineering marvel, but uh, sometimes they take really long. And then other groups are able to build them in just a couple months, maybe even a couple weeks. Um, and that's when it's kind of like they know exactly what they want to do and they just want to build lots of copies of their satellite. So when there's lots of mass production, you can go really fast. But if you want to build one, incredible specialized satellite, it can take a really long time. So what's the future of space tourism? So this is a really topical question because this is coming up in the news this month. I mean, we just had um, Virgin Galactic launch some people on one of their, uh, one of their inaugural actual like flights with, with um, a crew. And there's other companies that wanna do this too. So I'm not too sure what the future of space tourism is. Space tourism has been talked about for a long time. And, and right now what we're seeing are opportunities, kind of like an airplane flight for you to go on a, on a vehicle, like an airplane or a rocket 
and go to space for a couple of minutes and come back, almost like a roller coaster ride. You're just going up and then you're coming down. You're not staying up there. Nothing is being left up there. Uh, you actually don't go into what is orbit. You go into space, but you come right back. So there is uh, a lot of opportunity, I think, for space tourism. I'm not sure uh, how expensive it's going to be. Right now, it's pretty expensive, hundreds of thousands of dollars, I think, to, to fly on one of these. Um, so it's not for everybody yet. Um, but yeah, I think people are really interested to see the Earth from this new perspective. And uh, I expect it will be popular. I just don't know um, if it'll change or if it'll be a little bit different. But I, but I don't think people will want to go to space for like six months. That's not fun. That's physically challenging. Astronauts are some of the, the most physically fit people and they do psychological training and physical training. And every day they spend hours at the gym working out while they're in space to stay healthy. Space is not a place that we've evolved to live uh, in. So we are really good on earth with a lot of gravity and our air. So maybe little short visits will be popular for tourism, probably not long visits. Can a collision have a chain reaction? So this is a good question. So there's actually someone who's named after this idea. Um, but if you have one object hit another object, it'll create a lot more objects and those might hit other objects. And if you follow what I'm saying, then you might keep hitting more and more and more objects. Um, it's called the Kessler syndrome. And that's a possibility. If we have a really big collision, it could cause a chain reaction, creating more and more collisions. Um, that said, we have had collisions in the past and we have not seen chain reactions occur. So that's, that's a good thing. But uh, if we had a really big one, um, there would certainly be some worries, especially if it was high up in space. Uh, we'd definitely be worried if there was a big collision. We'd want to we'd make sure we don't have any chain reactions. James Webb. Um, yes, so I actually don't know off the top of my head. Uh, I don't know, B, if you know when uh, James Webb is. Uh, last I heard, uh, Halloween 2021. Okay, wonderful. So oh. Halloween 2021, this is a really cool satellite. Uh, it actually uses similar material to what I worked with on my drag sail. Um, James Webb is, is a very cold satellite and it needs to keep sun away. So it has this, what's called a sun shield, basically like an umbrella, except it's an umbrella the size of like a tennis court. And it's gonna protect it from the sun's heat so it can stay super duper cold and take really cool pictures of the universe. Um, so yes, it does have more capabilities than Hubble. It won't make the same kind of neat pictures that Hubble makes. It'll make slightly different ones, but they will be uh, better quality than Hubble. I've read that a person, yeah. So I have seen this too. I believe there's like one person in recorded history who's been actually hit by a piece of space debris. Um, I believe they were like sitting in their house and it like came through. I, I'm not sure if it's the same story that you're thinking of. Um, I don't know how often that's gonna happen. There's not that many people covering the surface of the planet. The planet is mostly water. So most things falling into falling back to earth land in the water. So I wouldn't go outside and be worried about space debris ever. Um, keep your eyes you know, on the roads, on the sidewalks and on cars and things like that. I'd be much more worried about them. But um, we, might, we might see if space debris gets managed well, well, we'll see less space debris landing on Earth, which I think would be good. So I don't actually expect to see more space debris coming down to the surface of Earth. I expect to see more of it burning up in the atmosphere. So maybe you'll see more meteors, but I don't think you'll see more debris on the ground. Oh, the goodness. Other, the only other oh. time someone has been hit by something from space was maybe a part of a meteorite uh, that made its way through. I know of one instance where ah, okay. they were filling gas or something and they heard a little something hit their car. Oh, and they were wow. like, what was this? And it ended up being a small piece of meteorite that just oh, landed wild. on this. Oh, that's wild. Yeah. So there, there, are, there are many stories. Um, especially if you look back at the older rocket launches of pieces of rockets, I wouldn't call those space debris because they haven't gotten to space, but sometimes countries do drop pieces of rockets and those do um, harm uh, towns and villages and, and cities and people. So that is something that has happened and, and you might see that in the news. Um, that's a problem. We do want to launch, more rockets are being launched so countries and organizations that are launching rockets, 
they need to take care and be safe about that. So this question, I don't know. I think we need to call an astronaut to do this one. If you fall out of your spaceship without your spacesuit, how long would you survive? I don't think it's very long. I think in TV shows, they make it look like you can do it for a couple seconds or maybe a half a minute or something. Um, I don't think you'd get uh, too far. Yeah, I think, I think I'm gonna agree with someone in the chat there. I'm gonna say less than a minute. Our bodies need atmosphere to keep all of our blood happy and all of our liquids in our body happy. Without that, we don't do very well. Plus our lungs aren't happy. Um, we're not designed for space. That's why we have spacesuits and that's why we have rockets. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna quickly mention, keeping an eye on the time, we have about yeah. two minutes officially, but if Thomas is okay to stay back for a few more moments, we can go through all of those questions. Uh, yes. But to everyone else who may have to hop off, uh, we had a poll on Slido as well. So if you're able to go in and fill in those details, we would really appreciate it. And uh, in the meantime, I'll, I'll give an official thanks, but Thomas, don't go away <laughs> just so quickly. Uh, we still have those few questions left. But uh, again, on behalf of all of us, we want to give Thomas a really big thank you for engaging and enlightening us on all of uh, what is orbital space debris and how, yes, we should all work towards uh, having uh, less debris and actually um, making sure we don't pollute either the skies or our, our planet and, and things like that. So thanks again, Thomas. Thank you, um, everyone. And reminder, we have next week's talk as well. But uh, yes, let's bring the questions back up and, and uh, we'll, we'll see which other questions didn't get answered. Mm -hmm. And everyone in the chat is saying thank you as well. So <laughs> if you don't have oh, that. Else. Very kind. Thank you for coming out tonight. I'm um, glad everyone has enjoyed the topic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Really cool. There are lots of oohs and wows during the <laughs> during the, the, the content. Yes. Um, do we have, yeah. are we bringing up the questions? So I can't have the questions up and the poll running at the same time. Oh, okay. So poll is up right now? Yeah. Okay. Um, while you do that, I can still ask the question. Um, sure, yeah. What percent of space area near Earth has no debris? Mm. <clears throat> so yeah, that's, that's a tricky one to answer. Um, most of the debris is in that low Earth orbit, right around Earth. So the least amount of debris might be in that sort of middle ground. And then there's even less when you go really far out. If you go to the moon, there's basically no space debris. But around Earth, most of it is right around us. It's pretty close. Um, so what I would say to that is the least amount of space debris, I don't think you're ever going to find zero. because. But, but keep in mind, it's always moving. So if you stand still, you might not see some. And then two hours later, something could potentially go by. Um, but I think the least amount is in that middle Earth orbit, kind of where the GPS constellation lives. Um, that's not used quite as much as the really far out orbit and the really, really close in orbit. Okay. Um, what subjects do you recommend for space industry and hobbies? Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, well, for myself, I can only really speak for myself. Um, and I was definitely a big fan of, I mean, I like to do math things, um, but I was a big fan of physics. Um, physics is, was always really interesting to me, like that kinetic energy I was talking about earlier. I love this idea that we have equations that can help us understand what's going on in, in our universe. We try to make rules and we try to understand what's going on. So physics, really good topic to, to get into if you like space, um, but, but I'll, be, I'll be honest, there are so many different careers. If you want to be an engineer, physics and math and chemistry, and those, those are sort of the staples of engineering. But if you want to work in the space field, there are lawyers, there are doctors, there are teachers, there are artists, there is everything imaginable in the space field now. Um, you don't Jeff. need to be a scientist. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to be a scientist or an engineer. You can be one of many things. Um, so. You know, what I would say is if you want to be involved in space, well, figure out what's really interesting for you personally. And then you should, I bet you can apply that to space. I bet there's, there's no shortage of need for what you're interested in, in the space sector. 
And then on hobbies, I think was the other one. Um, if I, I can, I'll speak to the engineering side of this. If you're really into, if you like the engineering and building stuff, uh, keep building your Lego, maybe play with some like little electronics, turning on lights with buttons. Um, I'm a huge fan and maybe don't go do this to like good working stuff unless you ask your parents, but I'm a big fan of like taking things apart and seeing what's inside and trying to understand what's going on, especially if it's broken then maybe you can get permission from your parents. Um, like I love to try to fix things, even if they seem like they shouldn't be fixable. And I'd say most of the time I break it, but then sometimes I fix it. So, you know, it, it's fun. It's a good learning experience. You, you sort of build um, a little bit of an intuition about how things work, how electronics work. And in the satellite world, we don't send a lot of people to space. We send a lot of satellites and they're built on robots. Sorry, they're built on electronics. They're built on... Uh, pieces of metal, they're built on um, uh, radios and computers. So you need to understand how all of that works, batteries, solar panels. So understanding how that stuff works is really important if you want to build spacecraft. Cool. Um, and then final question, and I'm hoping the person who asked this, I know I'd seen it in the Zoom chat, had asked, what is a satellite? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. And I think I think there's lots of answers. So the, 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 I think the simplest answer is that it's something orbiting something else. So we have natural satellites. The moon is actually considered Earth's satellite. Um, so, uh, and you can see Bayravi is on the moon right now. Um, so, but, but that is actually what we, we call it a satellite. No, usually we just call it the moon. We don't think of it like that, but it's actually a satellite of the Earth. Mm -hmm. So anything orbiting something else is a satellite. What we, what I mean when I say satellite a lot is uh, something that humans have made. So we have built something and typically it's, it's like a robot. It's like a computer with a power system and maybe it's got a camera to take pictures um, and we put it in a box. Typically that box is made out of metal and we strap it onto a rocket and the rocket burns some chemicals and it goes into space. And once it gets going fast enough, you have to go really fast, but once it gets going fast enough, it, it's able to stay in earth orbit and just constantly go around and around and around. And, and it slowly might fall back to earth like we were talking, but for a really long time, it'll just go around and around and around. And when you do that, that's a satellite. So when you put that robot in space, that robot's now a satellite. That's a good question. It is, yeah. Um... So I hope I, I answered it for that person and for everybody. <laughs> um, can a moon have a moon? I feel like this is a... Hmm. So that's that's a good question. And I think the answer is yes. I think so um, too, yeah. My answer, the way I would answer it though, I actually don't, I can't think of an example, but the sun, the earth orbits the sun mm -hmm. and the moon orbits the earth. Mm -hmm. So... If the moon was big enough, maybe something small could orbit the moon, right? You could have systems, things orbiting things, orbiting things. There's nothing that stops that from happening, um, except the size of the things matters. How much gravity you have to attract something and keep it as your satellite uh, matters a lot. The Earth has a lot more gravity than the moon. So if anything gets too far from the moon, it'll all of a sudden phew, over to the Earth. Um, similar to the sun, if you're, if, you, if you, the moon could orbit the earth, but if the moon got too far from the earth, all of a sudden it would start orbiting the sun instead. It would leave the earth. We'd never get it back. And the sun would be like, ha ha, I took your moon from you. Um, but, but yeah, I think you could have a moon orbiting a moon be an interesting, that'd be pretty cool. Actually. I'm, I'm trying to think I, nothing comes to mind, but, uh, extrasolar systems, uh, might be another place where this might happen again. We don't have any specific examples, right. but these are solar systems around other stars. And sometimes you have doubled stars and, and things like that. So again, we, we won't say no, <laughs> we just don't know. Yeah, and, and, I, and we have lots of satellites in orbit around the moon. That's something we've done too. So we have put human-made satellites around the moon. So it's possible to put things in orbit around anything in the universe, really. Mm -hmm. um, you just have to get close enough. Um, but yeah, we've got satellites there. 
we've got satellites around Mars, we've got satellites around Jupiter and around Venus and some satellites that are just going off to nowhere. Um, but, but yeah, we can put satellites almost anywhere we want. Whether or not a moon will naturally want to end up there, I don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, final question. Uh, if you weren't an engineer, what would you choose as your profession? Oh, yeah, I've thought about this. This is a, that's a good one. That's a really tough one. Um, so one thing is that as an engineer, I, I would also like to be um, like a teacher. So that's, that's part of the reason why I'm, I'm in school. I'd like to become a professor and, and help teach uh, young people who are excited about space and do research. So kind of that's like a little bit of engineering. It's also a little bit of teaching. But I've definitely thought about hmm, maybe teaching would be kind of fun, just uh, teaching at a high school or something. Um, but other than that, I, I do really enjoy working with robots. And I, in my current role as a PhD student, I see a lot of my application for robots, not just on other planets and, and other moons, but also here on Earth to help fight climate change, to help fight fire, forest fires, to help protect people. Um, I think that's really important. I really would do any work that's involved in either helping the planet or helping people. Um, it would always probably involve technology because that's just who I am. I really like technology and, and getting computers involved and building little things. And that's, no matter what I'm doing, that's what I'd be doing. But uh, you can apply that to so many different things. That's why it's a really fun field to be in. Cool, that's a really neat way. Um... Oh, and uh, I see uh, in, on, on um, Zoom, uh, Yusuf slash Shifa is saying, maybe you can be the professor when she's in university. Perfect. We'll that sounds good. A couple years. <laughs> yeah, yes. wonderful. Um, well, thank you again, Thomas. And thanks to everyone who stayed back. We're uh, 10 minutes beyond when we were supposed to wrap up. But I think this just indicates how exciting and thrilling this topic was for everyone. So. <laughs> Thank you again, uh, and we will officially wrap up tonight's event, and we hope to see you all next week. So with that, I'll say thank you, take care, and have a good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.